Test, test, Joe, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you in the Zoom session.
Testing. Good evening. The time is six o'clock. We, and today is Tuesday, February 1st. We are in our special meeting uh, for the purpose of discussing the items on the agenda. There are two items. Present in the boardroom, we have members Lessons, Jacobs, Donley, and Bellamy. Online, we have member Wilson. And we will update our attendance as board members either get online or uh, join us in the boardroom. All right. Um, with that, we'll start our session. I want to turn it over to Dr. Bishop. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the uh, team and I and extended team, we're all here to uh, share with you the budget that we've collectively put together that focuses on the goals and guardrails, uh, as well as um, really meet, meets the mark for uh, having a balanced budget. Uh, throughout it, we're going to uh, really start with uh, a larger frame of the timeline and then move to uh, just the different functions of how it was put together so that we create a mind's eye in understanding the interconnectedness of the different pieces of the puzzle. It's a, a complex uh, document. So we wanted to really break it down and uh, have uh, really some, some visuals that'll bring it to light. Uh, we will share with you um, some graphs financially of where we stand and then literally move into what do those revenue then uh, look like in our classrooms and our schools. And so uh, we'll present. Uh, we did a dry run today and took questions and saved them to the end. And I wanted to know, Madam President, if that um, the, the each slide uh, you have a copy before you also has a number at the bottom of it that if questions wanted to be we could go through and then save the questions for afterwards. Um, that might help with the flow because sometimes uh, when we had questions in the middle, the next slide or two answered the questions. And so since it's the first time uh, we can go through, but if you have a question, please reference the slide. And then for the audience, those online watching, we can pull it right back up so that when the question and the discussion and dialogue happen, that we'll be all looking at the same thing. So, um, is that good? Uh, that sounds good. Let's do the presentation and we'll hold our questions until uh, the end. All right. So we will begin <clears throat> with the timeline. I'll turn it over to Jim Anderson. Good evening. Um, I think everyone's pretty comfortable with the timeline. Um, we've been working on this for a while. We did the school and department budget item detail requests, November, December, and, and naturally um, we've been working it for the past month pulling this together. So tonight is 1 February. It will be non-action on 8 February and then action item on the 22nd. Um, we will start tomorrow with one-on-one -on -one briefings with the board members. At this point, I think we only have three scheduled. Um, so we're still looking to schedule the rest of those briefs. When we do the one-on-ones, we'll also have the Appendix C. So you'll see a slide here that, that kind of rolls up all the changes, but for those who are have done one-on-ones before, um, when we do that, we'll give you the Appendix C, which is every change year over year, and we'll also provide um, the, all of the ESSER three details while this brief is a little more 30,000 foot level. Um, so we'll provide all that to each board member and be resp um, respond to your questions, and I'm sure the, the questions will continue after that. And I will be followed by Dr. Bishop. Okay, so in that 30,000 foot view to understand what we've done with this budget is uh, we addressed the general fund deficit. Uh, we do know, uh, and we actually clarified and really worked with our principals in discussing this, the difference between um, revenue and then understanding how the general fund through the BSA is flat funded. Uh, the In December, and Jim will touch on this again, uh, we had a pro forma which demonstrated a large deficit. That is a true deficit given the general fund operational monies. However, uh, as you'll see in this um, presentation, we really are filling the gaps year after year after year kind of on borrowed time with um, outside the formula money, 
and uh, federal funds. And so uh, the bigger picture is about the general fund and addressing its deficit. And we do uh, address it in this brief, uh, but you'll see how that is um, a, a, a difficult solution uh, because it is just year to year. We did prioritize pupil teacher ratios and maintain educational programs. You'll see the effective use of ESSER funds to maximize the recovery from COVID-19, as well as filling that general fund gap. We will demonstrate a redirection of resources to focus on board goals, as well as some redesigns within the system already to focus on learning and the gaps that we have with students. Everything points back to what the board has already stated in its values and beliefs. So nothing that we're presenting to you is um, not linked. It, it is all linked and in a cogent um, manner to the board goals and guardrails as well, as well as the core values and beliefs. And those are, um, and you can look on your website, you know, the potential. We, we absolutely know that every student deserves an opportunity for achievement. There are high expectations and we want to create a culture of high expectations demonstrated through accountability and being transparent to our public. Also uh, focus on safety and responsiveness uh, in this ever-changing world. The next slide really demonstrates how are we tying these things together? How is the big a puzzle put together with all the different pieces or uh, some others use the connect the dots. How do we connect the dots of all the different functions in the complex system that we have? So when you think about the potential, of course, uh, the reading, math, college, career, life ready, and really investing in CTE programs. We continue high expectations through your outcomes, uh, the expectation of outcomes and monitoring those. The accountability, uh, as you know, we have uh, refined dashboards. They're very transparent. And um, on that accountability as well, we want to be accountable to our people. Uh, and so we have shared an advanced um, and enhanced benefits program. For safety, uh, we not only have the safety of facility where you'll see air quality in our buildings and the safety in regard to communications, but also improving the district's uh, mental health and physical health and uh, continuation of the school resource officer program falls in line with our uh, mental health and safety actions. Responsiveness, um, we have expanded uh, the ability to communicate with our public and internally and externally, as well as the aspects of the educational planning through the pandemic um, that uh, certainly demonstrated responsiveness and continuation of responsiveness given the choice of programs. I'm going to turn it over to Mark to really share how these um, actions are connected through a task force, uh, which is involves really putting actions towards uh, the goals and guardrails. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. In addition to the core values and beliefs, I have to put it right up here. In addition to the core values and beliefs, the budgets also represent the goals and the initiatives of the district. As you all know, um, at ASD, our initiatives and our goals are represented in the board's goals and guardrails. And so it's important to note that while the board goals and guardrails do not represent the only things that our district values, they do represent current priorities in a current state. And therefore they're embodied in their strategic goals and plans that we'll discuss. The next three slides are going to show how these initiatives are represented in the budget planning. This particular slide shows the various working groups that have been developing uh, project charters, goals, timelines, action plans, all of it through work with our project management staff. These working groups have teachers and administrators across various grade spans that have content area expertise in these areas, and they're developing uh, initiatives that would advance those goals and guardrails. As you're aware, the three main planning groups were college, career, and life, and reading and math, and the, and the group also with guardrails. The other groups you see here represented around the graphic are the operations and budget and outcome monitoring, and those are groups that are supporting the work that's going on in the other groups. Part of aligning this work 
involves aligning the resources and budget to those priorities. And just due to the sheer amount of state, local, and federal grants and all the various funding sources and all the thousands of account codes that go with all of those funding sources, the complexity increases exponentially. This next slide, Jim Anderson will provide a little insight into those funding sources. So about nine months ago or so, we started the strategic plans task force that Mark talked about. And by uh, middle, late summer, um, really these new initiatives and potential options uh, really started to, to come together. Um, we, we obviously couldn't resource all of them. So they were prioritized based on their ability to meet defined, carefully defined goals and objectives. We made sure that they could be evaluated and assessed and then we looked at the most appropriate funding source. When you look at this slide, um, you can see at the top, the general fund, transportation, student nutrition fund. Those are pretty easy to project. On the grants, the local, state, and federal grants, those actual amounts come in between springtime and, and late summer before we can finalize them. But, but basically, we looked at an initiative and said, is it short term? If it's if it's long term, you know that you really want to try to find general funds. If it's truly short term, one time, then grant funds are the most appropriate source. So that's kind of how we looked at all of the initiatives that came in. Um, also, one thing you'll see on this next slide is that when we looked at the initiatives, we didn't have enough funding in any one stream to be able to meet all of the things that were brought up. So many of the initiatives, if not most of the initiatives actually have multiple funding sources. So we built the following slide to try to give you a picture of how complicated it is um, to fund any of the initiatives he worked on. So this slide um, provides an example of the complexity of cross-categorical funding. And I think it's important to note that cross-categorical funding is, a, is an important tool in trying to advance our goals and priorities because it leverages many different funding sources and then many different account codes within those sources. As an example, if you'll see there the reading goal pulled out of the little slide deck, and you'll see that with just reading alone, we can resource that through everything from the general fund to Title IA, Title IIA, Title IIIA, Title IV state grants, uh, even the municipal alcohol tax with funds for pre-K is designed to help support those reading goals, for example. And this just tries to illustrate the need for aligning those resources from, from those funding streams. Many of you have heard of purchases around the Hegarty Phonics, our intervention programs around what's called SIPS, Springboard, Fast Bridge. All of these are uh, things that the educators know very well of what they do, but they're all funded from very different sources coming from whatever we can put together that's available. Um, in the general fund alone, there's example of multiple account codes that would cover reading goals, such as the reading curriculum purchases, reading teacher expert salaries, travel to reading conferences, uh, lots of money for teacher addenda to teach the after school tutoring programs and on and on. So there are hundreds of account lines that support these reading goals across multiple funding sources. And so the takeaway from this slide alone, the takeaway is that the budget really has to be considered as a whole. Any one line item in this budget may cross multiple goals, multiple guardrails, and can't be looked at in isolation. This budget takes another step forward in trying to align our work with our resources to the goals. And that's really the function of all quality organizations is to try to, to use every resource you have available to align that work. And so at this point, Dr. Bishop will briefly review some of the goals real quick. Thank you. So the beginning of this presentation was really to create that mind's eye of the back work that goes into uh, the budget that you see before you. So we're going to start with your board goals and guardrails. And we don't need to spend much time on this slide alone because we know the reading proficiency, math proficiency in college career life ready, we have had uh, monitoring updates in those areas, as well as uh, white papers in regard to the updates. And so uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into each one of these. 
And again, um, to demonstrate uh, just the interconnectedness, those uh, online, as well as we have uh, uh, quite a bit of staff that they themselves are responsible for certain functions within the budget. And we invited them here tonight so that your questions could be asked specifically in regard to any one of these goals and guardrails. So um, they were delighted to be with us here. So I just wanna thank again, our staff who's just amazing. So with that, um, I'll turn it back to you, Mark, uh, Dr. Stock. Thank you. So the next two slides, um, we'll, we'll talk about reading and math, and uh, Dr. Knutson will cover some of those, the major highlights. And we just tried to pull from our work just a few of the major items to just show you in one, one small outline format. And then after that, Dr. Johnson will address the college career and life goal represented in the budget. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Stock. So as we look at the reading slide here, um, funding for district reading goal is really focused on four areas. And those are represented by the um, four blue um, lines that highlight those areas. Um, first, a priority is supporting catch-up growth. And this is due to disruptions in teaching and learning during the pandemic. Um, catch-up growth occurs through focused, intensive reading interventions um, that occurred both during the school day and after the school day as well as expanding preschools so that um, our students can have those exposure to early literacy skills and have that coming into kindergarten. The second area of focus is um, really core reading instruction. Um, we know from research and our own experiences in the ASD that both focused research-based core reading instruction is a necessary foundation for our students to make both annual growth, that year-to-year -year growth, as well as our catch-up growth. And this may be achieved through integrity of our core curriculum with the support of instructional coaching, as well as universal screening and data analysis. Third, prior to the pandemic, we were initiating implementation snapshots. And that was part of our program evaluation of reading to see if what we were doing is working. That was halted when the pandemic started, but we will be resuming that component of program evaluation. Our implementation snapshots along with student learning data will provide a broad district picture of implementation and really help us inform our adjustments that we need to make to the program. And then finally in reading, we'll be continuing to invest in ongoing professional development on research-based reading instruction, database decision-making, and reading interventions for our new to district and our new to grade level ASD teachers. As we go on to math, consistent with reading, funding for the math goal will focus on catch up growth through high quality core math instruction, robust interventions, um, program, intervention programs in summer school, thoughtful database decision making, instructional coaching and professional development. It is important to remember that while we started implementing systematic reading curriculum and instruction prior to the pandemic, this year, the 21-22 school year, was supposed to be our first district-wide implementation of our math curriculum. So teachers have used the iReady Mathematics curriculum. They've had that. They've been working with kids. But given staffing limitations this year, we have really had to cut back on district-sponsored PD. It's been limited for our staff. Um, and instructional coaches have not been consistently available to provide job embedded professional learning at schools, again, to help with that staffing and covering classrooms. So therefore, next year, we're going to have a renewed focus on our professional development with math as we move forward. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Johnson now. All right. Thank you, Dr. Knudsen. So when we take a look at our College Career Life Ready Initiative um, and strategic plan, um, there are the there are many different indicators that we're concentrating on within that um, that goal. Um, but when it comes to the budget, we're we're focused on three main areas um, to really resource our our funding. Um, the first area is to support access and um, equity for our college career life ready opportunities for students. So sometimes when students come to us, um, there are some barriers for kids to access those opportunities, such as transportation being a big one. So finding ways to provide transportation for kids to all of those internships and job opportunities that we have within our system. The other uh, focus area that is a big uh, focus for us here at the beginning of our CCL initiative is looking at our career pathways and making sure 
that all of our kids around the district have um, a robust offering of career pathways within their, their school. Um, we're also looking at advising in the counseling departments within our secondary programs and giving the necessary professional development to the adults who are advising our kids within CCL. Um, we're also really focused on just implementing the additional student learning opportunities within CCL as we move through this strategic plan. So we're looking, um, we've already started this process this year and, and we've provided a few of these updates um, through different board meetings. We're doing a lot of work through um, our inclusive practices at the secondary level. We're also, you as a board have also adopted um, curriculum at the middle school level in math and language arts, and we're looking to extend those into high school for language arts um, in the near future. Um, one of the other areas is looking at um, student uh, computer platforms that really focus in on areas around CCL that can help advance this, um, these indicators forward for kids. And then just as a larger third category that we're really looking at is just support for the implementation of CCL. Um, one of the main indicators um, in the life ready uh, goal for CCL is um, a financial literacy component that will be in place for the next school year. Um, and we've done the planning work this year. Um, so there's um, funding um, support for that. Um, and then we are um, wanting to stay on uh, trend and with the latest research around CCL initiatives. So we are participating um, in a national cohort to keep our, ourselves on the cutting edge around this work. Um, and that's another support item um, as a part of this work as well. So, um, and then there's just a lot of people involved in this work with throughout the district from um, the school level um, to the Ed Center. Um, and uh, so it, it's um, just lots of people looking at this and, and a part of the work, um, and that's part of the funding as well. So um, I will turn it back over to Dr. Bishop. Thanks, Dr. Knudsen. I mean, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Johnson. Lots of doctors out there. All right, sorry about that. I paused because I knew that my brain was uh, moving. So uh, right onto the guardrails. And again, remember these are written uh, in the same way as um, you could say the uh, our Bill of Rights, uh, what you should and shouldn't do. Congress may not. Uh, um, so the superintendent will not leave student groups underrepresented. Uh, again, we know that we're developing a diverse and culturally responsive workforce, as well as not allowing unsat unsatisfactory employee performance. Finally, operate elementary schools without mental health services. We will not do that. And so understanding those parameters, we have built this budget around ensuring that we do not violate your guardrails and move towards action in the district. And the action is described uh, throughout the bo board guardrails next with turning it back over to Dr. Stock. Thank you. So the of the four guardrails that are represented there in the large blue blue lines, just a couple of key points. The first guardrail on underrepresentation in our lottery programs. Um, th these choice programs in our community are everyone's really proud of them. But what we notice is that that they they because of things like lack of transportation and other things, or other things we're not aware of, or maybe that some communities aren't aware of their choices that are there, how do we support that? It's so that we took the first step this spring of redesigning our software with a third party vendor to try to get baseline data on the application process. So we, we have data on who got in. We don't have data in the lottery on who the folks are that, that are applying. So that's the first part. Second guardrail is found in multiple places in the budget, including some of the collaborative recruitment efforts that are going on in special education and in HR, some of the uh, positions that we've tried to work through to build recruitment around those hard to fill places. We've also got places in the budget that address incentives and bonuses for hard to fill positions in the district. So those are represented by that guardrail. The third one on employee performance, We've supported that one through some increased training and major efforts in supporting uh, not only our certified uh, supervisors, but our classified supervisors as well in dealing with employee issues. The fourth guardrail I want to spend a little more time on because this one is one of the more significant ones uh, that we're working on. The fourth guardrail has to do with uh, the elementary 
mental health issues, and even on a larger level, the whole K through pre-K through 12 mental health area. So one of the things we've done, we've begun some planning for district-wide integration of our ASD behavioral health services. Examples like school psychologists, counselors, nursing, behavior strategists, our SEL work, which we've been well known for around the country, our crisis response and our safety and security programs, our community mental health services. You've been hearing about our partnerships with Volunteers of America, Providence Behavioral Health and Alaska Behavioral Health, just to name a few. And so our goal is to develop a strategic, multi-tiered system of supports for around mental health that will enhance the board goals and student learning. And so in order to do that, we're looking at a, a bit of a shift in the organizational leadership and department focus to support that. We've hired a, a senior director of mental health and student support with some of our grant funds that will take in effect July 1. Uh, after a series of interviews, uh, our top candidate was Dr. Knutson, who has a school psychology background. We're excited that she's excited about uh, moving into that arena. In addition to that, our new senior director for health services, Kate McClellan, who's over here, has a strong background in these areas of, of social work and mental health. And so these two are partnering together and they will begin the collaboration phase and uh, we will do some reorganization. So under Dr. Knutson's work, we will reorganize some staff that has to do with the psychologists, the elementary counselors, the behavioral teams, our social emotional learning programs, which have been in place for a long time, and our federal student support programs will fall under her. So we're still working on the details of how that org chart and all of that will play out in, you know, later, but that position will take effect July 1. Um, in addition, there's some strong support for behavioral issues you're going to find that I'll cover later in the special services or special education budget. As you're well aware that throughout the last couple of years, the increases in not only mental health issues, but just behavioral in, uh, in general. And so we will show you the addition of some behavior strategists at middle school and high school levels and we'll try to begin coordinating those resources to support. So that's a review of the guardrails. And at this time, uh, I think Dr. Bishop and Jim are gonna talk a little bit about school funding since 2017. All right, and, and I'm gonna start this with uh, just acknowledging that in the rest of the country tomorrow is Groundhog Day. Uh, here in Alaska, it's Marmot Day. And um, it just reminds me of this section uh, that we're about to begin because um, my experience in senior level leadership at a district in districts, uh, this one as well as our neighboring, really has been uh, the last 16 years. And it seems as though the story is the same over and over again when we go to Juno. And so we want to be crystal clear with the board as well as the public in understanding why that is that school districts across our state continue to go down to Juneau and talk about funding. Uh, many times we use the term flat funding or we've been flat funded um, or um, it isn't necessarily true in that the revenue has been flat because as you can see this graph demonstrates that there has been an influx of money especially in the last uh, FY22, money for next year, and FY24. That's demonstrated, however, in federal one-time funds. And Jim will go into the, specific, the specifics of the spending, uh, understanding the timeline for which it has to be spent. Now, what has been apparent is that large blue line. So the reason we continue to go down and say the same things, and it seems like the same story is happening when we wake up again every spring, is because of that 5930. And Jim will really describe uh, all the inputs that have gone into the budget and into the BSA uh, as either operational funds, one-time monies, or grant funds. The red line is the inflation, and I, I it doesn't translate exactly, but technically we're living on borrowed time. We're living on borrowed money. We're, we are living on credit in our school district. And so I want to be really crystal clear that in December, when we shared the performa with over $60 million in a Delta, that 
this is why. So we're moving through and have a balanced budget next year without reductions, but the only reason why is the federal money. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Jim to share that. Thanks, Dr. Bishop. So this is, I think, our fourth iteration of, of an attempt to show um, what the fiscal cliff looks like, when, it, when we're gonna see it, and how big is it. Um, it also is an attempt to um, give the legislators their due. When we're talking to Juno, they have given us money in one-time funding. Um, it just didn't inflation-proof the BSA. So if you look at this chart from top to bottom, left to right, the red line at the top of the chart depicts the BSA's inflationary increase based off Anchorage's CPIU uh, from 2017 through 22. The rates from January 22 through the end of 24 are estimated at this time um, based on a 2% steady inflation rate, and they also reflect adjusted staffing levels based off projected student enrollment in those years. Above the dark blue bars, the gray, light blue, and gold bars um, represent BSA equivalent funds. So if we put $8 million in uh, fund balance towards something, it wouldn't show as 8 million, it would show as the BSA equivalent. So we keep this chart where all the numbers mean the same thing all the way across for when we're talking to external stakeholders. The state of Alaska did provide one-time funds in both FY19 and FY20 in lieu of a permanent increase to the BSA. The Anchorage School District has applied fund balance since Dr. Bishop got here for every year, except for this current school year. Um, we've also used federal relief money for um, certainly this year, a little bit last year and a significant amount next year, as you can see. Uh, the dark blue bars do represent the BSA. Um, the last time it's changed was the legislative session in 2016. And from then they set it at 59.30 from 2017. So it represents no change um, on years 23 and 24 in the state's formula. Although there are several bills currently in the 32nd legislative session that may increase the BSA or one-time funding if passed. Fiscal years 22, which is this year, and 23 relied heavily on federal ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 grants. However, there are not enough federal funds remaining in FY24 to close the structural deficit unless other revenue becomes available or the district reduces a significant number of uh, requirements. On the far right, you'll see that if there isn't an infusion of new revenue, that we will have exhausted the ESSER funds and the shortfall is a BSA equivalent of approximately $620. During the past five years, and it's important to, as we talk to the public and we talk to the legislators, ASD has done a lot in the last five years um, because you do see gaps underneath that red line so what, what has ASD done? We, we've closed two schools, Mount Eliamna and Mount Spur. We combine numerous programs like Crossroads, Avail, Paidea. We merged two schools into one facility, King Tech High School um, and Alaska Middle College School that was formerly in Eagle River. And we do reduced staff accordingly in order to achieve a balanced budget each year. On top of that, we looked at how do we increase revenue opportunities? Um, Dr. Bishop stood up the Alaska Middle College School um, and, and really it didn't just save us money, but it provided even more resources for our own students. So when Alaska Middle College or Alaska Middle College School costs us a little bit about around $10,000 per student all in. If you look at all of our other high schools, depending on whether they're Title I, all funds in, it's thirteen dollars to $18,000 per student per year. So Alaska Middle College School is, is not just um, cheaper, um, but also provides and attracts students who are formerly outside the district to get into a special unique program that, that really might fit them. The second thing that, that Dr. Bishop did was um, start the partnership with the Lower Yukon School District and their Kuselvac Academy. 
So Lower Yukon pays for the staff to be able to hold a third tier of CTE training for their students, but there are many, many empty slots which allow our students yet one more opportunity to take CTE classes that otherwise wouldn't have been available for them in their schedule. And questions will be at the end. I'm yeah. sure there'll be more, but you can always find yeah. me offline. And, and I'd, I'd like to just, as, as Jim and I watch, and this is very, for those of you going to, to Juno, when we watch um, Senate Finance get uh, the report from OMB at the state, state of Alaska, they are reporting on all revenues. And so our legislatures will see graphs that show continued revenue going to school districts. And it looks like it's increasing. And we really, Jim did, an, I think, an excellent job of demonstrating that when you then, although the first year it spends the same, we then continue to go have to go back to the well, go back to the marmot each day we wake up and have to each year of budget season to go back. And that's the biggest picture with this uh, to have in your in your head that it isn't necessarily it, it is the BSA is not what Jim called inflation proof. And that's the a major issue for Alaska right now. Thanks, Jim. And back to you. OK, if there's if there's one takeaway as you're having uh, discussions on that last chart, it's that if you want to implement what we've been doing in the last few years, multi year programs, it's that being able to budget on a 12 month cycle with no future forecast of additional funding that that definitely um, it has been with us. And, and I don't like marmots anymore. So I'll turn to Andy. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so this slide you'll recognize it's always, you know, we've kept this pretty standard as our general fund revenue slide. Uh, the big takeaways here are, you know, we're going to be a bit down about $16 million in revenue. When we reported the pro forma, I think we had it at about $20.4 million in revenue lower than what our current budget is. We did get our demographic projections back. Um, you know, originally we had about 2,400 students uh, or ADM lost between our FY22 adopted budget and the kids that actually showed up in FY22. So our demographic projections has come back with about 250 students in the district or ASD facility-based uh, programs returning and charter schools have projected another about 350 students returning to those programs. So about 600 ADM or so more than what we had originally uh, put in the pro forma before we had gotten our, our estimates. So that's really the driver of why that uh, deficit in our revenue goes from 20, negative 20.4 million to about 16 million. Um, you'll notice about most of that is within uh, the foundation funding. You know, certainly it's due to a loss of enrollment, but uh, also a step down in the hold harmless provision from a 50% hold harmless rate to 25%. And then about a two and a half million reduction, a corresponding reduction in the additional allowable contribution uh, from the municipality. Uh, so that's our revenue picture. You know, not a whole lot of updates other than just uh, updating our, proje our projections for our enrollment. Uh, this slide shows our anticipated spending on the ESSER funds. As you recall, we did do a board memo that allocated an initial tranche of the 112 million that we received. Uh, to things like allocating the entire amount of indirect cost of charter schools and of some uh, some other facilities based things that we really wanted to get working on for this year. So this is the allocation of the next 91 million that we said we would come back to the board and ask approval for and this will be included in our budget book and um, we want our approval, you know, to be in conjunction with our actual budget document as, as uh, we normally would. So really, I mean, this focuses on our, bo our board goals with graduation, CCL, and uh, IT. The big chunks of this are the I IT instructional support. That's our one-to-one -one program that also includes uh, all the Chromebooks we have to purchase for that, all the instructional software that we're purchasing with uh, respect to virtual learning, and um, get the FTE to support those, and the addenda that we pay elementary school teachers to run to handle the tech requirements at those facilities. Uh, the other big tranches you'll see are the reduction in class size, the maintenance of PTR. That's about 477 FTE, a little over $56 million. That's a really, a large chunk of this money is going to retain PTR. 
And if you look across to FY24, you'll see that and the virtual is gone because we really just spent out as much, you know, this accounts for the $91 million we have remaining. Um, we are gonna do a series of air quality improvements to help the airflow within our schools, as well as um, safety improvements with our intercom systems that are using old analog systems at 16 schools. And then we have um, our transportation fund oh, is, sorry. So transportation fund, the bigger changes here are as we've taken out the general fund contribution and instead we're planning to supplement that with uh, local tax contributions as will be below the municipal tax request. Um, the transportation funding is expected to go down by the state and we're not anticipating usage of fund balance in there. Although we do have some fund, fund balance remaining in there, but we have not settled the transportation contract for this year or next, but we should have sufficient funds to be able to make that up. However, you know, we don't want to obligate those prior to uh, having those contracts settled. Um, but this, the transportation fund, this will provide the same level, level of service that we are, uh, that we're doing now. Hopefully we'll get more drivers and have those routes filled and we won't have the work stop or the shortages and routes that we've experienced at, at some points this year. Um, but again, you know, it's gonna be pretty well, we're planning to have the same level of service that we really hoped for this year. For student nutrition, again, you know, same thing. We plan to have about the same level of service as we do this year. Uh, not a whole lot in terms of their total budget changes, but um, you know, this, the, this is a group that does a, a whole lot of work and feeds a lot of kids, about 23,000 meals per day. So we just uh, hope to be able to keep that program going. Okay, I'll take this slide. So this slide should look familiar. Um, I've had it in a couple different methods prior. Uh, this slide depicts the general fund expenditures by state function. And as you look along the bars going from top down, um, there's also red letters that signify the amount of ESSER funds that we're planning to direct toward three of the 12 state functions, instruction, support services instruction, and operations of maintenance and plant. 72% of the district's revenue is directed toward instruction, special education, and operations of maintenance and plant. The brown bars represent those functions that directly allow a school's building doors to open and close each night. They represent 93% of the district's general fund and 94% overall if you include ESSER funds. District admin is just over 1% of the district's budget. If you look down and see the district admin support, um, for those who aren't familiar, it does contain an awful lot of functions required to administratively um, operate the district. IT is 57% of all district admin support costs, but well more than half of all of their costs are software and hardware and contracts that support the district. On the bottom, you can see the breakout of where our funds are used to support the district's mission. And we're still well over 80 plus percent, um, almost 86 of the district's total revenue goes towards salaries and benefits. That's actually one of my favorite slides. So thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm gonna begin the snapshot so that we understand uh, describing the revenue and the different functions, what does it look like in schools? And so these next slides give you a picture of the staffing levels and changes in our schools. Uh, just uh, for a reminder that the PTR is a budget staffing formula. So it's not a class size or a class cap. It's how many teachers are assigned per students. And then a principal of a school would have that flexibility to meet student needs. As stated on the ESSER slide, over $56 million was put towards 477 FTE for next year. You did notice that we didn't define the following year of FY24 and it was a smaller amount. Again, as a reminder, ESSER monies need to be spent by September of 2024. There were enrollment changes strictly based on student enrollment. Consequently, at the high school levels, we added three 
They are growing. We had to reduce 18 teachers in the middle schools and nearly 47 teachers at elementary schools. And so we'll go through each one of these different levels individually, turn it back over to you. Okay, Dan Barker, Senior Director of Elementary, notably not a doctor. So I just want to make that clear. There's a lot of those floating around. Um, so for elementary, the, the good news here really is uh, you've heard from Dr. Johnson, or excuse me, uh, Dr. Knutson about our curricular measures, both in English language arts and mathematics. So that's a lot of the focus of what we're doing with our teachers and where we're going forward with the curriculum for students. You'll the, the t a big takeaway here for elementary is that since 2017, again, if you think back to that BSA piece, the, the state has not increased the base student allocation since 2017, yet we have kept that away from the classroom. So we have maintained the same uh, classroom PTR ratio in elementary that we have had since 2017. The rest of the metric up here are some of our support folks, and that also has remained static since 2017. So in elementary this spring, we will see some of the usual movement that we do based on that enrollment driven reduction that Dr. Bishop just talked about. That will be folks moving from one location to a next based on reducing or increasing student populations, but again, no reduction to the base uh, uh, or to the allocation of, of teachers to students in elementary level this year. All right, thank you, Mr. Barker. Uh, so Kirsten Johnson uh, from secondary again. Um, so I have a few different slides here um, to talk about. First, we'll look at middle school. As Dr. Bishop mentioned, we are looking at a reduction of 18 teaching staff based on enrollment at the middle school level. Um, there has been a significant drop in uh, enrollment based on our projections for next year at our middle school levels. Um, that said, when we look at our um, support positions, which this slide articulates um, by school, um, we felt there's been a, a very big uptick in our response needed by our support staff at schools due to mental health and COVID mitigation and just our public relations with our our, um, our parents and, and the public that comes to our schools. So we felt it was very necessary to keep our support staff robust um, and as is. Um, so you don't see a lot of changes there, although you do see one reduction at Golden View in security. And that's based on need of the school um, and responding to that need. So, um, so you'll, you'll not see a lot of changes other than the reduction of FTE based on enrollment at the middle school level. If you go to the next slide, um, this looks at our big eight high schools. Um, as Dr. Bishop mentioned again, there is an increase in FTE. Our high schools have remained relatively stable for their um, enrollment and, and in fact increased slightly um, in, based on projections for next year. So there will be um, some slight teacher increase um, FTE at that level. Um, and again, much like middle school, be, due to the, the needs um, at, in terms of our support positions, we felt it necessary to keep um, the, the positions that are articulated on this slide fairly stable based on a, a steady enrollment at high school and the needs at our schools. So there's, there are no changes at high school on this slide. Um, if you look at, to our alternative schools, um, these are our schools that have very specific populations. Um, you will notice some changes here. Um, and, and often um, we have some of our more vulnerable populations at these schools that need additional support. Um, so there is um, a reduction of a counselor um, at, at AMCS. Um, that was um, kind of a, a budget correction, if you will. Um, within our budget, um, we, we did take a uh, teaching staff and um, replace it with a counselor. So, so that's just a budget correction in, in the budget this year. And then when you look at Benson Secondary School, um, as the board um, that has heard um, previously, um, programs such as Avail, Covenant House, and Crossroads have been consolidated into Benson. Uh, secondary school and due to that increase in student programming, we, there was a need for a full time nurse. That's something that we've supplemented outside of the budget and we're, we're now putting into our, our budget for Benson Secondary School. So you'll notice that change in the budget as well. So those are the three slides from secondary schools um, and just an explanation of that um, PTR.
So this next slide um, talks a little bit about the general fund school-based changes. So the, the first one talks a little bit about those metric reductions that you've been hearing about. So the total amount there you can see on the side. The next one talks about metric-based teachers being moved uh, to ESSER 3, previously funded by SIRSA and ESSER 2. So that's another one of those changes that is occurring within the budget. Uh, we just mentioned the Benson Nurse. Uh, there's another one shifting to 20.13 uh, TA FTE from ESSER over to the general fund. Uh, Dr. Johnson mentioned the reduction of one security at Golden View. Um, the other one is just a vacant elementary library assistant that was adjusted. Uh, she, uh, Dr. Johnson also mentioned the counselor one. And the, the one that says charter school changes, those are changes that were recommended by the principals of the charter schools themselves. Those were not things that the ASD staff directed, but those came directly from them. The next slide talks a little bit about some of the special education service changes that we've had. And so uh, based on their, their budget requests, we've had to add two uh, deaf educational interpreters and an intervention coach for the deaf program. And we have reduced 1.5 FTE at Whaley and we added a behavior strategist. Now by reducing that, that, those were unfilled positions. So it wasn't like we had to reduce the staff person. We didn't have anyone for that. So there was a conversion over to a behavior strategist. Um, we had two uh, school psych uh, openings that were vacant that we'd never been able to fill. So we have added some behavioral analysts and middle school and high school behavior strategists. And this is part of our attempt under that guardrail about working with our behavioral health and mental health and how we can support our teachers in, in some of these issues. And as many of you already know, um, we have some changes coming in our seclusion and restraint and all of those things that feed into the behavior pieces. And so this is a, a high need in all of the schools. Uh, you'll see two uh, elementary school intervention coaches for special ed, and then, the, of course, this, the summer school addenda. So those were the main ones there on that one. Um, the next slide talks a little bit about our district, total district-wide changes overall. So the first one, there's been a little bit of reorganization and some, some personnel changes in our HR department, and you'll see that some of those were funded through elimination of one of our other programs that we ran, uh, it was called Glint, and we've used, repurposed those funds, which we're not using now, and, and done that. The, the task here is fitting our guardrail about recruitment, and they are forming collaborative relationships with special education and working hard on trying to recruit in those hard to fill positions, which we know is a need. Uh, the one that talks about the 0.5 FTE and equity and compliance, that was a combination position that was partially funded between communications and split with equity and compliance. And with our social media needs increasing uh, and equity issues in their office increasing, we've made both of those essentially 1.0 and not 0.5. Uh, skipping on down, the, the CTE technology specialists, those were being covered through reduced addenda but those are needs as the CTE department and the career college life continues to expand. There is a lot of very proprietary level software that they have to have. And so they need another position to help with that. Um, skipping on down to the one that talks about increased custodial FTE. You'll see a big number off to the side. I wanna explain that one. Uh, there was just one increase as far as FTE with the custodial, but the, all of that other money that goes up to the 1.1 million was in supplies, services, playgrounds, boilers, and a, and a large collection. And so when you do your individual uh, meetings with us, and we can get into the schedule, we can get into the details of all those if there's further interest, but this just explains the big ones. And of course, the biggest one on the sheet uh, is the school resource officer budget line of 2.3 million. And so that's uh, where we pick that up through the district-wide changes. And so those summarize district-wide changes. Oh, um, Madam President and board, we have uh, provided you 
a pre preliminary budget that addresses the general fund deficit and also explained the reason why there is a general fund de deficit. Uh, we prioritized classrooms and maintained our educational programs. We utilized the ESSER funds to maximize the recovery from COVID-19 to address the learning gap. We also redesigned educational supports to address the learning gap and finally redirected funds and resources to support what the board said is the main thing, your goals. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Thank you, staff. I'd like to uh, welcome um, members Higgins and uh, Holloman who have joined us online. So at this point, we can accept questions. If you're online, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll, I can see you. Um, so who has questions for the staff? And I do want to remind board members, if you have not signed up, I see you, Dora. If you have not signed up for your conference, for your individual um, session or small group session to one or two people, please do so tonight. Member Wilson, I saw your hand. Just a quick question. I was hoping that I could get a little better picture of what the behavior strategists do, um, what their role is in a school. If I can get just a little more explanation about that. Thank you, uh, Member Wilson. So behavior strategists and behavior analysts uh, are a little different and Tarlisha Wayne would probably be better able to explain that. She's not able to be here tonight. But what I can tell you is that their express role is to try to work with the staff around helping them with forming the, the, the functional behavior analyst. Uh, there's, I'm looking for the term now, the FBAs and the, the, uh, the, the BIT plans that go into their IEPs. But when students have behavioral items on there, there's a lot of work they have to do with school psychs. And part of those behavior strategists and analysts are there also to help the school psychs with data collection so we can help get the students in a place where they'll be successful. So it's working both with adults and with the children. Did you have a follow-up member? Wilson? I do, if, if that's okay. Um, is it particular schools that we have these um, staff available to or at elementary, middle, and high, or how are those schools selected for, for these particular staff? Uh, Ms. Wayne hasn't told me exactly which schools they're targeting. They're still looking at the needs, but the way I understood it is in our budget, we've placed positions for two elementary interventionists, two middle school, two high school, and how they would be deployed would be based on the IEP needs of the year. So those at this point haven't been determined what schools they would serve. Thank you. All right, thank you. Who else has a question? I see Member Jacobs and then Lessons. Thank you, Madam President. I wanna first thank the staff for the presentation. I know a lot of work went into it, so thanks. Um, Question on page 14 on the first uh, guardrail. The two strategies regarding leaving student groups underrepresented um, in lottery and application based programs. Um, the two strategies are facilitate changes to third party software and strengthen awareness of choice in underrepresented communities. Are there dollar amounts attached to those two strategies? And can you expand on what strengthen awareness of choice uh, means? Thank you. So, and, okay. and Dr. Stock, um, just as a reminder, um, Sonia Hunt is online as well. And so depending if you need to, uh, yeah. who's doing the work. Okay. Yep. Thank you. On the, the lottery uh, question. So, so far, the only budget item on there has been some small uh, amounts that are buried in the IT budget because we had to work with the vendor to redesign, reprogram. The, some of the lottery software. So that wasn't the initial step. But the part about awareness of choice and underrepresented, uh, a good example of our beginning kickoff is February 19th. Yeah. Would you like Sonia to answer that one? Sure. Sonia, did you have something to add in regard to strength and awareness of choice in underrepresented communities?
Thank you so much. Um, we've been working on this collaboratively and looking at resources like transportation, um, general awareness of the programs offered and really seeing how we can really um, contribute to an uptick of um, students, various students uh, from a variety of backgrounds really um, being able to take it or have access and opportunity in this area. And that's the only thing that I would add. Thank you. So in addition to that, February 19th, we will have a, a fair here of all the optional alternative and lottery programs here at the Ed Center. And so uh, there will be uh, all of those schools with booths and we'll be trying to raise some more community awareness over that as, a, as an initial step. But the rest of those uh, guardrails, they'll, they'll, they will come forward and as the work unfolds. And, and I'd like to be clear that the work isn't to eliminate people from attending these um, by having more, um, it's really to engage and make the pool of people in the lottery uh, larger and um, representative of the school district so that the chance of getting uh, selected through the lottery uh, is greater. Did you have a follow up member Jacobs? Uh, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Member lessons. Thank you. Um, I feel like I have a series of questions, so I'll just sort of work through them slowly and take my turn. And Madam President, um, I was just texted. Um, the the software alone, just to change it, was thirty three hundred dollars. You had asked for just a small. Okay. I know that's just a drop in the bucket, but I was just texted that, so I wanted to share. Okay. Thank you. So let's take your yeah. first. All right. This is question and follow up. I um I brought our current budget with me just because it's a handy point of reference. I'm a little bit more familiar with it. And in comparing slide 20 with the equivalent, which is the expenditures by state function to the general fund, that sort of helps me understand some of the biggest shifts. And the one that maybe caught my eye, well, there were a few that caught my eye and I just wanted to make sure that I'm reading this correctly and we can talk about it more in detail um, in my meeting. But um, I noticed a $21 million increase to the district administration support services, a decrease of about $4 million for special education instruction, um, and about an increase of about $5 million for operations and maintenance of plants. And then of course, a, a big increase in instruction as well. Um, so I just, am I reading some of those shifts kind of Are you on the bottom correctly? Top? Yeah, I'm looking- okay. I'm sorry, I'm looking at this and I'm comparing it to- Oh, I see, oh, okay. We um, understand the question. They it's understand the question answer. well. It was purposeful so what we did, I'm so just, I'll turn I'm it over. Right, so in the past we had, um, we have attrition estimates for how much staff and unspent money we're gonna have. Um, typically in the last few years, it's been in the 18 to $20 million range, but we've always put that in a single line item account. And it's always been on that uh, district admin support services. So. What you would see in previous budgets is about a $20 million kind of paper reduction in that in that district admin support services. So if you look at the, in that budget, you'll see the actual cost in the $20 million range also more closely aligned to what we actually show in the budget. So with this budget, we have about 20, a little over $24 million in district attrition, but we spread that to all the different state functions. So you get a better idea and the board and the public has a better idea of what we're actually spending in those functions and not having that uh, big mass of a negative attrition reduction in any one line item. Um, special education, that's one where we have a lot of hard to fill positions and they have about 35% of all the attrition across the district. So that's why you see the reduction. Um, and overall, it's about eight and a half million dollars that we've applied to, or eight and a half, nine million dollars that we've applied in attrition to just special education. Uh, instruction. Yeah, and I just want to share the history behind this. Prior to really the team of Jim and Andy, uh, we did not report the budget in state functions because we had different functions in ASD. Uh, we transitioned that through their business process review in 2016-17 to strictly state functions so that uh, we can compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges from districts around the state. In that, we had had that account uh, that they have. Uh, we did make a deliberate decision this year to really make it more transparent and, and have those attrition accounts in those differences. So we continue to uh, increase um, efficacy and 
really ability for people to look up and um, find the state functions and where the money's spent. So uh, we had to talk about that. <laughs> Should we do it this year or not just to see, but um, uh, we think it's uh, higher transparency. And, and just to point out, um, some of you might remember uh, before, before Dr. Bishop, certainly when, when uh, Carol Coma was here, at the end of the year, all of a sudden, they would, they would have like $20 million that just came up. And, and it was because they didn't have attrition accounts. So first we established an attrition account, spent several years trying to, to tinker with it to try to get it close to actuals so you could have some historical data so you could break it out by bargaining groups and by state functions. And so the next logical step, once you feel comfortable that now you, in a non-COVID year, um, but, but once you feel like you now have, you know, several years of data where you can comfortably break it out with some accuracy, it, it really made sense to go ahead and do that. And part of that's been in, uh, in recent years, we've, in some of the contracts we've bargained out, we used to pay on medical waivers. When a, an employee would waive medical insurance, we'd still pay into a uh, health trust or whatever account it was in, depending on the bargaining, bargaining unit. Um, since those have been bargained out of there, you know, that's about 700 people or so will waive insurance and of $20,000 a piece, that's 14 million. So the bulk of this attrition money is within that, that medical insurance realm. So this is kind of context. It's kind of a newer thing that we have this amount of attrition. I think we've always had some, but you know, the, 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 the actual amount tied to that is quite a bit higher than it used to be. I have one, one second uh, question. Another big issue that continues to be on my mind is um, the PTR. And my sense is that we have had a study and we have this evidence-based model of class sizes at about 15 for our youngest students and class sizes of 25 for grades four and above. Um, what would that cost to implement here? I guess, why, why don't we see that as a, why don't we see that as a focus and what we haven't done a complete analysis in the last couple of years. The last time it was over $150 million more per year to implement it. And uh, to share why it isn't in the budget, um, we actually, will you share just the, that you have to have a balanced budget? We have placed in, in prior years, just grants that cover the amount um, simply because of the function of budgeting. Could you guys share why? Yes. So by state statute, we have to have a balanced budget. We can't have, we can't budget for $150 million more than what we have. Um, it, 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 we can't. Um, about, about four years ago, and, and I know Mr. Donnelly remembers it, um, we had a similar discussion at a budget brief, and it was the night they were going to approve it. And all of a sudden we added, I don't know, $80 million worth of state grants that we never received, but we added wedges for all these different things. Um, and I, I think the thought was, if we can show Juno that we need an extra $100 million, that maybe we'll get more. Um, it really wasn't very, it wasn't an effective way to share the message. And, and I think, um, I know Dr. Bishop and I have spent hours and hours and hours lead, leading to the, that last slide so we can give the legislators credit while still being able to articulate um, that education costs more because everything costs more. Um, and, and we really had to be able to figure out how to show the fiscal cliff because it's really difficult when you're like Andy and I and and Dina, we could visualize what the fiscal cliff was. We knew about what it was and we knew when it was gonna happen. It was really being able to paint that picture so we can talk to legislators and say, look, this isn't made up. You, you're right. There were years that uh, you gave us one-time funding and we used fund balance and we used all these things. And then we closed schools and merged programs and added AMCS and, and Lower Yukon's partnership. Those were all those things we did to try to, to bring that red bar down on all of those years where it shows above. Um, and I, I don't know, I th I, this is the second year of the 32nd legislature. So that means that anything that doesn't get passed by the end of this section session is dead. Mm -hmm. And they start all over from scratch again next January. 
So when you're in that kind of timing position and it's an election year, it seems like it made more sense to really set ourselves up for success and being able to inform the legislatures, show them visually, have those discussions about what it really means and, and try to find some success in the next few months because you know, realistically, they're, they're probably not going to have multiple extended sessions because um, they can't campaign while they're in session, right? So we have a short amount of time and this seemed like the better approach than putting in a bunch of wedges for grants that aren't included in any bills. Okay, so I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, page uh, 14, under guardrails, just would like a little bit more um, information about um, the co increased collaborative recruitment efforts in special ed and HR. I'm assuming HR is like all other positions. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I think uh, Matt and um, he can call on others, but I think um, Sonia Hunt might have some information, Matt might have some information on just the the work around this. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bishop. Uh, to the president, uh, the the collaboration exists as, as referenced in the slide between talent management and special education. And that's been uh, the case for some years. In fact, the uh, current recruitment structure in the district uh, that we have a single recruiter who focuses uh, much of her energy on the special education, hard to fill positions and those needs. Um, we, we have a budget adjustment suggested to uh, free up some time in that recruiter position so that uh, those uh, duties can be spread across other uh, areas as well. And then special education would engage in some of its own recruitment efforts, but that collaboration will continue. Um, we also have, as, as Dr. Bishop referenced, and, and Ms. Hunt may wanna speak to this as well, but the, the talent management department uh, within the HR division works with the Office of Equity and Compliance through the various initiatives identified by that office um, to w whether it's to uh, adjust in our recruitment strategies, the work that talent's doing to align with uh, the, the mandate um, uh, in, a, in a program or initiative uh, led by that office, that being the Office of Equity and Compliance so that efforts are aligned or to, to work toward development of, of some collaborative initiative. And, and that effort, as I said, in HR is led by Peggy Rankin, our Senior Director of Talent Management in, in, in conjunction with, with Ms. Hunt's uh, work as well. So I don't know, um, Sonia, if you'd like to, uh, to add anything. Um, I think uh, to the president, to members of the board, superintendent, um, I think that Matt uh, did an amazing job presenting the information. Um, if we were to drill down a little bit, what it looks like is a lot of pathways work to make sure that there are people in the pipeline um, to result in having a more diverse and culturally responsive workforce. So that looks like um, growing our own initiative or lit now. It looks like um, the um, aforementioned um, collaboration between special education and human resources that includes that pathways again, where uh, many of our TAs are diverse and just getting them what they need to be able to become uh, full-time teachers and the like. Okay, so uh, can you mention leadership as well? Sure, um, including in that, included in that portfolio are a number of things, which includes our leadership program for BIPOC educators um, as a means to um, studies show that oftentimes when people are, were, are, are applying to jobs that um, particularly people of a certain generation, a younger generation, um, barring any age discrimination or anything like that, they look for a pathways, right? They look for companies and organizations where they can see a pathway. And the leadership program for our BIPOC educators provides that recruitment tool as well as retention strategy um, and a pathway into leadership for our current teachers. And it's open to all AEA um, members. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And so just, so it, did I hear you say, Matt, that there was a, we have a recruiter right now that's going to be 
doing the collaboration. I get the special ed HR piece. Those are our most difficult and hard to fill. I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of the other jobs in the district. And, and Sonia did uh, address, you know, the leadership pathway, growing our own. Um, and so, okay, is there, a, is there a dedicated position for recruitment or is that in Sonia's office? The, the, the current year budget, uh, Madam President, is that the recruiter within the HR department is funded both on the HR budget side, but also um, through special education. Oh, okay. What we found okay. is that, uh, and I don't have the exact percentages, but a, a fairly sizable percentage of her day-to-day uh, -day is spent in uh, working with special education, which is a good thing to fill those hard to fill positions. Mm -hmm. But we recognize to your point, the need to uh, have a full-time dedicated uh, recruiter across district functions um, to assist with not only those special education positions, but other positions as well. And so before you in the, in the presentation of uh, the budget going forward would be to dedicate that current position in HR as an HR funded position. And then there would be uh, a recruitment function on the special education side to, to sort of uh, not, not necessarily separate those, those functions, but, but to have that collaboration continue while, while having more time uh, available in the HR recruiter position for across district work. Thank you. And my, my final uh, question re for this one has to do with the incentive bonuses. Is that separate from what we expect to have in a, in a new contract, AEA contract, or does that include what we expect to have in a new AEA contract. The, it, if that made a, any a, sense. <laughs> not so much. I don't, I don't think, uh, Madam President, uh, at least in, in the presentation before you, uh, contemplating uh, anything that would change with adoption of the contract. In the current contract, there, are, um, there is an, an incentive available in those hard to fill uh, areas um, that's been in the contract for some years. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, there has been a practice of uh, hiring bonuses for special education uh, positions in particular. Um, those efforts began uh, some years ago and, and continue. And as, uh, as Ms. Hunt referenced, there's, um, we have a number of other initiatives on tap um, going forward, um, uh, particularly when I want to mention, take the opportunity to mention, uh, the paraprofessional who has interest in moving into a, a special education position in partnership with a uh, post-secondary uh, institution in Alaska, looking at beginning summer 2022, uh, a program where that, uh, that, that individual would have opportunity to move into those uh, degree programs uh, for the benefit of the district after they graduate um, with a um, requirement that they move into a position as a special education educator with the district and Super excited about providing more details of that as we get get it set up. And Great. Madam President, many of our other uh, difficult to fill positions are not in uh, teaching and learning. Um, mm -hmm. We have bus nutrition and custodial bonuses as well. Okay, thank you. All right, Member Higgins, thank you. Yeah, and I guess I'll, I'll chat offline. I, I think that when I look at trying to have a, a diverse culturally responsive workforce, I think of almost an affirmative action program in which you're analyzing how effective, what the, what the workforce would look like if we looked at the available workforce. If 10% of the workforce was uh, in one category, you would try to achieve that as a goal. And then you look at how well you're being effective just recruitment. Then you look at the next step, how well they're being screened in and the like. Is that taking place that you're analyzing the, the um, effectiveness of, of the recruitment and the selection process, all of it, or you're just focusing, on, focusing just upon more recruitment period? Because I'm not quite sure I, I caught what I was looking for in the way of answers to that. Uh, thank you, uh, through the president, to Member Higgins. We, we do look, look, of course, at the life cycle of the employee, um, beginning with the applicant application phase. There are, uh, there is, I would say, a, a currently a top-heavy uh, focus on, on recruitment efforts. Uh, those are uh, 
in, in place, have been for some time, not just through our recruiter, but um, we have um, an onboarding induction generalist to assist in those tasks. Um, we, we do though, uh, when we identify uh, an applicant and um, sign them for employment, so to speak, um, also have retention efforts uh, because we view those to be uh, equally important. Um, there's uh, obviously a, an ongoing interest in maintaining the talent that we're able to attract. Um, and, and so we, I would say that we've not traditionally in the district, at least in the years I've been here, had a focus on those retention efforts. And that would explain uh, some, of the, some of the dedicated human resources that we've uh, identified already and, and proposed going forward with uh, some of the um, academy work, both on the certificated and uh, classified side, particularly with supervisors to encourage not only um, promotional opportunities, but also just in engagement generally as a metric for, um, for uh, increasing and, and, and bettering our retention efforts. Um, it, we do um, uh, use data analytics to, to track the success of those efforts, uh, but those um, uh, depend on which, which component of the recruitment retention, uh, I guess, cycle we're, we're focused on. Um, some, some of that is, is through programs that uh, uh, in reference to, to Glint earlier, which was a, an employee engagement um, uh, a program that we used uh, with, with some success, albeit limited um, uh, time in, in terms of how long we engage with that vendor. But we were committed to uh, moving forward uh, using data to, to analyze how successful our efforts in re both recruitment and retention are. And thank you, um, Matt and uh, Mr. Tiford. Sonia, can you add uh, additional? Your uh, camera just came on. Did you have additional to add from um, the work we're doing with other surveys and reports? Thank you so much, Dr. Bishop, to the president, to members of the board. Um, uh, this, uh, I guess the question or my thoughts on it uh, response to the question is a bit layered. So we do know that 16% of our AEA members are um, would be considered culturally diverse or racially diverse. We um, see a lot of hope in our um, APA bargaining unit and that 25% of the members of that union would be considered um, racially diverse or culturally diverse. Um, and so um, when we have taken a deep dive as just as a collaborative effort between HR and the Office of Equity and Compliance, we, under Dr. Bishop's recommendation, we looked at the data from just the application to the actual hiring. And we looked at the availability of the workforce and the credentials of the workforce um, citywide. And what we see is a real deficit of those that would be eligible to teach or are tracked to go into teaching. And so um, many of our applicants don't even identify what, they, uh, what their identity is. And we realize that it is a sensitive topic, um, but that information has, looked, uh, has been looked at um, collaboratively between our office Office and HR to be able, or talent management, to be able to address um, it from a data perspective. We continue to work on those efforts um, and um, sharing uh, a job announcements far and wide. Um, and it has been also a focus of particularly the work um, in just assessing the work um, to be done by the Office of Equity and Compliance. So I hope that that answers a little bit of the question. It does, thank you. Uh, member, uh, oh, Donnelly. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Um, do the numbers in this presentation include the increase increases if the tentative agreement with the teachers union is adopted? Okay. And on page 14, it shows the, uh, the projected funding gap between FY23 and FY24 as a BSA equivalent of $670. And how much is that in millions of dollars? Member Dolly, what page? I'm sorry. Page it's the bar graph, oh, but we graph. will, um, 15. 15. Oh, no, okay. 16. I'm sorry. I thought, yeah. Okay. I Thank you. 15. I didn't bring the spreadsheet with here. me, and you can get close, but I will oh, definitely 15. have that ready for the one-on-ones. Do you have a ballpark? Uh, last I heard it was in the 70s, 70 millions. 
Uh, well, the 670 BSA equivalent is roughly about 48 million. Um, then we have, you know, some of that leftover money to, you know, if we're expecting a 70 to 80 million dollar budget gap in 24, we still have some of that ESA three money remaining to cover it, and that's that other. Uh, was it 300? 220. 220, sorry, the number small. So yeah, about the 670 represents about 48 million. So the number between the BSA and the inflation proof BSA is about the same, um, but we still have ESSER three remaining in 24 under the current plan. So that's okay. what shortens it, but naturally in FY25, when there's no more uh, three. That's what I was confusing right? 25 with 24 because I think that the, the number so in there was right around 70, 24 drops off pretty big and if it were to stay the same in 24 I or see. we would get one time money in 24 but nothing in 25 then you would you would really see uh, obviously a, a more significant gap. But again the, that um, I think the proportion of the money was was very planned out because it has to be spent in that first quarter. It has to be spent right now by um, 30 September 2024. 30 September 2024. That was actually one of my next questions was the, the block of um, COVID impact funds that are shown on this graph for FY24. Um, well, actually, let me ask it another way. The block of COVID funds that are shown on this graph for FY23, are any of those eligible to hold over till the 24 to reduce that gap there showing of about $48 million? Of, of course, if you, if you look at the way that we've laid it out, if you look at whether it's um, the air handling system or anything else, there's always the possibility like this year that we devote um, money towards positions that can never be filled, and then that money rolls over. Um, on Tom's lane, where he's got intercom systems and air hand or, or air purification systems, we haven't done the contracts yet, so we don't know the exact timing of how that'll be, but you can roll money over as long as you spend it by uh, September 2024. So the way that we look at as we get through 23 is you always spend uh, the most restrictive money first before you use general funds, therefore freeing it up more for uh, more flexibility for the school board and administration to devote Jim, towards other priorities. How many paychecks would we um, have by September 30th, 2024 dispersed? Uh, just one. Just one. So do you see our, we would pay that that's a big chunk of change for that first paycheck of the 85%, you know, it goes to people. Uh, so th that was in the planning to be sure. Um, carry, making him just even would be difficult because um, we wouldn't have the ability to expend them. Because of the imposed federal dates on the money. Yeah. yeah that, and, and what I'm looking for here is a way to soften the, the blow, to close the gap um, by potentially spreading out the ESSER, the impact funds longer. But it's looking like that's going to be very challenging to do. Um, this, to close this gap right now, the only proposal I've seen on the table is to get a BSA increase of about $670 mm -hmm. per student. And I was just wondering, we know that there hasn't been a BSA increase since 2016, but what was the largest one that was ever, do we know what the largest one in the last 20 years has been? We have a spreadsheet that goes all the way back, but they've also changed the formula a couple of yeah. times. So I don't know if it's like Fuji apples and some other kind of apple yeah. when you do that comparison. Um, it was during the time that Sarah Palin was governor. So that's how far back it went. Um, I do remember it. And the, the majority of the growth was in the intensive uh, where they initially over three years went from counting the person, you know, the multiplier oh, the, went the, up and up and up, yes, but that was the going a big up, study up went 14 on 14 time. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering what's the historical perspective of a $670, $70 increase to the BSA. I don't think that's ever happened in the history of the state. And I was just trying to look back and what were the last time there was a big one how much it was. And I'm guessing it was about in the hundred million dollar range. It's just my guess. But if you've got a chart, I think, I think it's important to look and because it really sets the, 
you know, a sense of the reality of how large that kind of request is compared to anything that's ever happened before. Um, we can do this. I, I think this is also the first time that we've gone five straight years without the BSA improving. So, um, but I, I'll, I'll work on that. And once again, I'm just looking for realistic ways to close this close gap, gap here mm -hmm. um, because it's bad enough in FY24 where, where it's still mitigated by some COVID impact dollars. But when you get to F FY725, it's just astronomical. It's just huge. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's start over. Member Wilson, do you have any more questions? Oops. We'll come back. Fine, thank you. Thank you. All right, Member Jacobs. Thank you, Madam President. So uh, question on the on the guardrails, uh, again on page, I think it's 14. Um, the last one regarding mental health services, the reorganization uh, that will hopefully um, allow for higher access for services in at least elementary schools. Can more information be relayed as to what that looks like, practically speaking? Will there be someone assigned to each school? Um, what will that access look like after this reorganization? So what we're doing right now is looking at how we can take our existing internal services, <clears throat> excuse me, such as school psychologists, counselors, the behavior strategists you, you heard about, and really coordinating them together so that we can look at what those services look like across all of schools so that we can have equitable access. You're going to be getting this month a report on this guardrail that's going to give you the initial numbers of what our current status is. And that's going to provide the foundation about starting to look at how do we make that more equitable across schools. The other thing in supplementing this is really working with our community partners like Volunteers of America, um, Providence Behavioral Health as another avenue to provide services in our schools. And really looking across all of those resources we have in mental health and just really systematically figuring out whether we have um, equitable access at every school, as opposed to placing counselors separately, school psych separately, we do the um, community mental health separately. It's pulling them all together to see how do we make a systemic um, plan so that all schools have access to those services. So right now, every school has some access, whether it be a counselor, a school psychologist, behavior strategist, but we wanna ensure that all schools have a very, um, good access to all of those services in a, a systematic way. So you'll see the foundation of where we're starting from and we'll work on that next year. Did you have a follow up? Yeah, something tangentially related if you'll allow Madam President, um, it was at least behavioral health supports. Um, the SRO program funding of 2.3 million that's being proposed, uh, what funding tranche uh, of ours have we identified as that coming from? Uh, that's just right out of the general fund money. Yeah, sorry, I was here. Okay, uh, member, we still have about 15 minutes to uh, ask more questions before we have to do one more thing. Uh, let's see, next on my list is member lessons. Thank you. Um, I'm reflecting on our our prog or progress monitoring, our um, goal monitoring from last week, two weeks ago, or the last iteration, reading proficiency. And I'm thinking a lot about this year's first graders and second graders as being some of the most impacted from online schooling and COVID disruptions. And I'm wondering if $150 million for changing PTRs across the K-12 system is out of reach. If there's a way to sort of surgically target those particular cohorts with smaller class sizes, and if so, what a, a 15 student PTR would look like for grades um, one, and two, one and two next year? Excuse me, two and three two next and year. Three. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I had written down. <laughs> Thinking that maybe some of those are some of our most vulnerable students and that they fall squarely in line with our with the board's goals. Um, it's sort of a, su a right. supposal. Uh, in regard to requesting a, an additional grant from the state or reorganizing the funds that we have, um, or, I mean, all could be possible, but um, if it's within this budget, you'd be looking at something else to remove that to place there. But I could have Diane, or if you just want to speak to first and second graders uh, in the need, I mean, the it's pretty tremendous, um, but some of the things that we are doing for them. So that data is showing that those students do need some intensive intervention and not necessarily increasing teachers is going to fix that. We just need to make sure that we're providing those evidence-based research um, interventions to students. The more research shows, the more time we spend with students in, in that environment with intense instruction, the more that we can catch those students up. Um, and I believe, can you speak a little bit to summer school in regard to carrying these students forward? I know we don't catch all students, um, but what would that look like coming up? Right, so we still have a good whole half of this year to continue to help catch these students up, but then we'll also provide a very targeted um, summer school program like last summer where we saw significant gains with students, we'll do that same very intense targeted instruction for students this coming summer that will be utilizing those interventions to help those students catch up. All right, let's go back. To, oh, can I have oh, one quick follow-up? Sure. Second, second question uh, distinct from the first. Um, I'm hoping that maybe one of, maybe Mr. Ross, you could speak a little bit more about the ventilation plans. Could you articulate what that looks like within, you know, some of the specifics that you proposed here? Through, through the president to member lessons. Uh, absolutely, thank, thank you for the opportunity. So in, in short, there, there, there are two efforts. The first, the first, uh, we, we've discussed previously, and that is the, the intercom to replace the, the TC6 systems, which are, which are dated unsupported uh, TCU. Uh, the, the second more involved though, which I think gets to your question, the, the district has 24 schools and, and two buildings, our student transportation in our, in our maintenance and CPC building. They operate it on what are, what are um, their HVAC systems, uh, are, are operated under a pneumatic control system, which is a somewhat aged uh, technology. Uh, it's largely dependent on the thermostats, air compressors, um, compressed air to, to, to function valves, um, dampers uh, to, to move air. What we are proposing to do is to replace this aged technology with electronic control systems which we will um, have on our DDC or direct digital control. And, and what this does is a couple things. It, it nests very well with this transition to Dezigo. So with, with the electronic controls, we'll be able to optimize the, the air flow, air movement uh, in our classrooms. The problem with the pneumatic systems is we can't really monitor them. We can't track them. We can't, we can't adjust adjust them um, without having to go down to a school to make adjustments. When you're on a DDC system, you can do it from a computer terminal. So this will allow us to optimize airflow and air quality. So that's kind of a long response to your question, but that's the, that's the initiative to, to replace those systems in those 24 schools. Got a follow up? Yeah. <laughs> um, so if there's 24 schools that would be slated for improvement, what does that look like at the other 60 some odd schools that we have? So, so the, the other schools are, are currently, they're, they're electronic, they're, they're on the DDC system. So they, they are not in need of that conversion. Uh, and, and again, what, what those schools will get though is this conversion from the Apogee management system to, to Zigo again. It's, it's all about optimizing 
the, the air flow and temperature uh, in school buildings. Okay, thank you. Member Higgins, you, second time around, what you got? Uh, I don't have any additional questions right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Donnelly. Thank you, Madam President. Um, in, a, in an organization that wasn't so, have such a high percentage of, of labor costs, which is 85% of the total budget going to personnel, I would be trying to find ways to utilize those ESSER, the, um, the impact funds in FY23 to reduce our ongoing operational costs. But I guess it's almost impossible since so much of our ongoing operational costs are just a, such a high ratio of the, of the total. Um, but I'm sure you've thought of that and tried to find things like that. Um, um, I guess my other, my real question is, um, can you remind me what the, the stu 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 teacher student ratio impact it would be of of that gap that's being projected for FY24. Um, and I would guess that we could just focus on the high schools because the board's pretty much had a consistent policy for many years to try to not increase the, uh, the elementary grades. Um, so if it was utilized in secondary grades, what would we be looking at? If so? we, we really didn't do it as if we really would just do PTR because there would be a lot of other structural changes in the way the district operates. Um, we clearly would look at programs, um, special programs, structure within the organization, um, a lot of other things than I can't imagine we would just look at PTR. So I, I, I honestly didn't do it. Okay. I was just trying to get a sense of how big a problem that is. And one of the things you can, you know, relate to is the size, the classroom size. And of course, there's a there's a facilities concern there too, because our classrooms are just not designed to have more than thirty students in them, really. So that's another issue. Yeah. Um, through the president and and remember years ago when we were coming um, before the one time monies were given uh, as you can recall we we did suggest some program changes to put more students in the classroom or, or to not put more students but to put more teachers into gen ed classrooms so we proposed some redesigns and we thought we were coming to higher class sizes if you can recall the over 40 health teachers, you know, that was literally what um, Jim's talking about in regard to a redesign. And we were taking pos positions that were outside of the core classroom and putting them, pushing them back in. And so in general, you can say um, there would be a balance, if you will, of, um, you know, a few kids added to classrooms, but also programs that um, we've had in our district uh, for a long time would have to be adjusted as well. You know, whether that's time that the students go to them, whether that's uh, the number of choices of, of music or, or the number of choices of uh, extended day programs and things like that. So um, in that sense, it really would be closing additional programs or schools and adding students uh, to classrooms. And we did not at this time specifically want to, in, in fact, Jim does have this year without the ESSER funds, it would have been 10 kids in every class to add. That would have been the PTR, but without those ESSER funds. But the idea of what we telegraph during these things um, in the environment that we have right now of high stress <laughs> We just chose not to 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 go there to stress people out. But but there it is a you know the last thing I want my employees to be doing is is worrying about money and next year and the year after and the year after you know there's there's already enough stress right now. A couple uh, I see you, Mr. Holloman. We'll we'll close with you in just a minute. But, uh, but for Madam President, but I do want to add that we stress about it a lot. Right. <laughs> we try to keep the stress away from where the learning is happening. Yeah. 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 So the, these guys stress quite a bit, but yeah. uh, just trying to keep that away from where the learning is happening. And my twins are going to be in high school those years, so uh. I'm stressing about it also. <laughs> 
So for when we have our smaller sessions, I would like, to, I have three things that I'd like to get more information on. Um, one is whether or not there is a grant out there somewhere that we could get for the SRO program. And the other is um, we currently do not have SROs in our policy. So do we need to have, what do we need to do to absorb that cost? And I'm not, I'm not sure that, I don't know that we have time for the answer today, but um, maybe when we get in our smaller, in our smaller groups. And then the other question I had um, had to do with, um, well, I guess those are the only two, if we can do some follow-up with that. Member Holloman. Um, I was just gonna say, I appreciate the presentation. Um, yeah, I, I see it as something that focuses on the areas that are critical to us and kind of streamlines, it's not, transformational but I, I don't know any way a district could be transformational without additional funds I mean we we have a lot of different programs they all mean something to somebody they they are all having a positive impact uh, in my several decades in the Anchorage School District I never saw people any significant number of people working or doing something that weren't having a positive impact on some group of students and, and so unfortunately, if we really try to put resources into a new area to address places that we know we have shortcomings, it means money has to come from something that's working. Um, I don't know how we solve that until, until the funding picture changes in a way that, that lets us be a bit more innovative uh, than we're being. So I appreciate the thought that went into it and all the work by staff. Um, I think it's reasonably clear it, it is a budget that uh, provided we do find uh, the funding to, to fill the gaps doesn't threaten staff, it doesn't threaten existing programs, um, and, and I think that's a pretty good way to move forward after a couple of years of high uncertainty by so many people in the profession. Uh-oh. Looks like you froze. Thank you, Mr. Holloman. I think you froze on us. Okay. Anyway, thank you. You guys, I, I mean, I, I have had like sleepless nights about this budget. I don't know how you did it. It's magical. I thank you. Your slides get better and better every year. Um, I really do appreciate the work that you put into it. And I look forward to my individual consult. So thank you. Uh, the last thing on my list for us to take a look at is the um, superintendent search uh, um, timeline. Madam President, may I excuse the folks? Oh, absolutely. Would that be all right? Absolutely. Those that want to stay can stay. Yeah, this Thank will you. probably, hopefully, it won't take but five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again, everybody. So the time, uh, we have a request from the search consultant uh, to extend our uh, schedule by two weeks. And so what you have before you is what that would look like. The extension would really be moving uh, 219 to 35 and then um, adjusting accordingly. The reason for it is so that uh, one of their primary recruiting events is a superintendent's conference, which falls uh, in the middle of February, <laughs> the, 17th. the 17th through the 20 something. And so um, that, is, that is the request. Now I've heard from some of you, but I haven't heard from all of you relative to, uh, you know, um, but thank you, Katie, for sending this out. Questions? Yay, nay, yes. Yeah, I, I think I shared with you, and I don't know, if, I don't remember if anybody else was on the email. Um, that does happen to be the day of the ceremonial I did a rod start on the on March 5th. That may or may not matter to anybody else in Anchorage, but <laughs> it is a festive day. Um, but I guess I also wonder, um, is the weekend prior too rushed for the consultant? 
the weekend but like the 26th. 26th 7th do they do they need that extra time to sort of digest she indicated she did so i um i mean i can go back and ask her if if she if the tw that would be like the 26th and yeah what, what if we moved it to the fourth Uh, I mean, I agree that it's not going to be good to go in on the Iditarod for you guys. So <laughs> I'm there with you as an Alaskan here. Um, why don't that whole, because it's 3-5 is a Saturday. Why don't, why doesn't 3-5 2022 fall? And because it's three, it says week of 3-7. You could do the questions on Monday, which is the 7th. And then the, you could do interviews the rest of the days of the week because all right. of these go into each other. You know, just say week of three, seven, you're going to do everything in that block. Okay. It's only one extra day. The fifth would be our, that's the work day. So we need to have that work day, but we could probably do it maybe on the fourth. That's a six. They want at least six hours of our time. Right. What I was saying, you could do that six hours. Does it need to be on a weekend? I don't. Madam President, we have a joint assembly school board meeting on Friday, March 4th that yeah. morning. But I think that the week of the seventh is an interesting idea. So just do the seventh. That's true. Okay. It's so. also it's also I mean it's a spring break week, but um, none of us are under the age of eighteen. <laughs> <laughs> Carl. Uh, yeah. No. I I think the the small tweak we just made works. I don't have any objection. Okay. okay. So we're gonna look at the week of the seventh. Yay. Uh, Andy, Dora, week of the seventh for that adjustment. Pat? Works for this me. This is Dora. Thank you. All right. So uh, you got it, Katie? All right. Thank you, Dr. Bushel. Thank you, everybody. Um, with that, our work session is over.